Hi, I hope that you're doing well. My name is Alina and you are watching my Sleep Talks channel. Today I'm going to answer some of the questions that I received on my YouTube channel as well as my Instagram page and I hope that you will find it useful for yourself as well. And before I start, I just want to say that I'm not a medical doctor uh, and none of this is a medical advice, so just sharing my general ideas and thoughts. So today I'm going to answer three questions from three people and um, the first one is from Ellie. Hey Alina, great video by the way. That was the comment on uh, one of my recent videos. This question is unrelated to insomnia, but do you have any advice on how to not catastrophize as someone who has anxiety? I understand that anxiety is just there to protect us, but even still, how can I minimize the scale of importance about some things? I have a pretty objectively stressful major in college, but it seems that I tend to overly stress out about things even more than my fellow peers. I think I just struggle with, uh, with taking life too seriously, maybe. Have you ever struggled with this? Thank you again for, uh, for this channel. Thank you, Ellie. And um, yes, uh, I definitely do uh, overthink a lot of things and I do catastrophize a lot. <laughs> And this is something that I also kind of like working with, but I do have uh, general thoughts on that. So maybe you'll find it useful as well. So the way how I view catastrophizing is that it's just a tendency of our brain and it is kind of like automatic uh, tendency. Uh, I like to kind of dig in the, in the evolution and try to explain things from, from evolutionary standpoint. And the way how I explain this is that our brain is, um, tends to be more pessimistic rather than optimistic. So if you imagine someone who has been, um, you know, some caveman uh, from thousands of years ago, uh, who would hear something in the forest and then they would assume that it's not a big deal, there is like nothing, nothing bad is happening. So they would make a more optimistic prediction and in case they are wrong, this is when uh, uh, they might lose their lives. So from that uh, point of view, being pessimistic was much more uh, reasonable uh, because uh, if, if you happen to be uh, wrong, then nothing really happened. You just like stress a little bit too much. But if you're right and you manage to escape and, and prevent, uh, um, you know, prevent some uh, dangerous situation this is that mean that meant that you could survive so currently obviously we don't really have that many dangerous things in our lives we are generally safe uh, most of the time this is why uh, sometimes we we feel that this uh, catastrophizing is uh, uh, something that shouldn't be there uh, but we still have the same brain, the same brain that reacts to uh, things just like it did many years ago. Uh, of course, currently because it's uh, we are we are safe, so so the importance of those uh, catastrophizing thoughts is not really uh, proportionate, like proportionate to the to the actual uh, to, to the reality of things. Uh, and, and and the way how I think about it is, is that. You know, catastrophizing comes from thoughts, right? So when you are worried, uh, the brain sends you a bunch of signals. What about this? How, how about that? What if that happens? And, and these are thoughts. So that means that they are intangible. Uh, they come to you and then they leave and, and uh, just like signals. And, and the beauty of, of the whole like, idea like of our, of our brain that we always have some thoughts, always. And sometimes those thoughts are very innocent. They're just about like, okay, should I go for a walk now or something like this. Those thoughts, they just come and they are not really, um, uh, they don't really trigger in, our, in us some strong emotions. But then there are some thoughts that our brain labels as important. And then we try to, you know, like kind of um, uh, solve them or we just like start developing those thoughts in our head. Uh, and what I find uh, useful in these situations, knowing that catastrophizing is, a, is an automatic tendency to kind of like reclassify 
the way how we view those thoughts. So instead of something important, we can, uh, we can think of it, of it as uh, automatic. That doesn't mean that by changing that, we, like, we need to change the way how we feel about those topics. We might still feel like, you know, hyper aroused, feel worried. But at the same time, the moment when we start seeing those thoughts for what they are, and they are automatic, they are the product of the brain uh, with, uh, with its survival mechanism, then uh, we get ourselves out of that, uh, that catastrophizing process. We are no longer entrapped there. We are more like an observer. So I find I, uh, awareness uh, very useful there. And another thing, like when it, uh, when it comes to our general life and taking things less seriously, I think that putting it again in, in perspective, like your current... Uh, your current struggles or current problems at, at your at uh, at the college, um, in perspective that that, that could really uh, maybe help elevate the importance of it. So, for example, you could think, okay, would this bother you in five years? Or if you think about the whole scale of the universe, like how huge is that? Like how many things are happening in the you know not just on the planet but outside of it. And just thinking about like a little bit like changing your perspective instead of instead of you know micro micro lens try to apply this uh, telescopic lens and just think about the whole thing like what is what is now happening and then switch back to your current problem possibly the way how you would think about your current problem would not be as um, uh, as you know uh, um, I don't want to say like mm, important but but maybe less uh, bothering because in reality whatever we are struggling with now it will pass and uh, I would say that this is something that can a little bit keep us um, uh, more calm okay I, I hope that this was helpful <laughs> let me know maybe maybe uh, at some point I will be able to more crystallize my thinking about catastrophizing but so far really like th th these are the thoughts that just like uh, come to my mind when i hear similar question like this one okay uh the next question is from uh, Kara. my sleep has gradually got better and better after a long spell of insomnia this last last month uh, has been really good then i had an, an all-nighter what causes sudden hyper arousal i hadn't been thinking about sleep at all well, really sorry, Kara, that this happened to you. I know that it uh, it is really unpleasant when uh, we feel like we've been uh, like on a really good, uh, uh, we've been recovering, and and we felt more confident about our sleep, and then suddenly, it like it seems like out of nowhere, this kind of sleeplessness happens, and and especially when it's like all nighter. I know that it can uh, make anyone feel like scared. Like, what's wrong with me? I haven't been thinking about you know, sleep. And I do, like, I, 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 it totally makes sense. You know, when you sleep well, you don't really think about sleep. There is nothing to uh, kind of be um, cautious about or, or you know, there, in, in terms of like, you know, how brain works is that the brain wasn't trying to save you from not sleeping because it was kind of, it felt already safe. So there was no need to send you all those signals telling you, okay, protect sleep and so on. So this is why you didn't have those thoughts. And now suddenly after having a good stretch now you don't sleep for a whole night at all uh, this can definitely puzzle anyone so to me this kind of like uh, the, the last sentence I hadn't been thinking about sleep at all it, it kind of um, makes me think about a similar, um, similar, similar thinking pattern like you know I didn't do anything wrong what did I do wrong what, like how could how could this happen so it, it's again about like expectations so we think about that when we were sleeping well for some time that we were doing something right and now as our sleep started like you know uh, becoming more elusive then we think okay I did something wrong I did something like uh, or, or maybe maybe something isn't working and and this kind of like thinking that having no sleep thoughts means that you should have great sleep is is tricky because that means that you don't give yourself any possibility 
to have a night where you sleep less or a night where you fall asleep a bit later or a night when you generally feel more alert or whatever. So, and, and these nights can happen and we are not uh, immune against those kind of like nights in general. Like no one can have the same good night for the rest of their lives. No one, it's not possible. So I would say that not allowing different types of sleep to happen is a way how this attempt to control um, uh, is, is like manifested. So may maybe this is something, some kind of like um, thinking pattern that you haven't been aware of. So I would say that uh, first of all, you didn't do anything wrong about this. So uh, the fact that uh, you haven't been uh, thinking about sleep doesn't mean that you know sleep will always come like on, on, on a schedule uh, and with that said I would say that the the first reaction to that okay I haven't I didn't have any thoughts and yet I'm not sleeping as I you know as I used to you know before there's something wrong you know and that now that initial surprise or that bewilderment uh, Mm, triggers this kind of feel, uh, fear response uh, and this is how like uh, you know like hyper arousal grows and then you find yourself awake all night so I just want to like just show how that kind of like reaction and and this um, assumption that having no sleep thoughts should protect your sleep can create like some trouble uh, sleeping and now the reaction to that once it's happened it's happened now the reaction is what matters a lot. So um, usually people tend to kind of analyze what did they do wrong? Like I haven't been thinking about sleep. I wasn't worried. I, I didn't try anything and so on and so on. But the problem is that, or the actual, the, the, the thing is that it's not about that you did do anything like it, that you did something wrong. It's, it's really not. And uh, sometimes we just, any person can experience like occasional sleep, uh, sleep, uh, sleeplessness, and I really like the analogy that um, uh, that uh, Coach Daniel from uh, the Sleep Coach School uh, makes about this like hiking uh, on a you know on a mountain and then like stumbling upon some um, some some rock and then instead of trying to you know uh, uh, fixate on that just like just keep walking and and uh, uh, sleep eventually resumes. So I hope that this, uh, this can bring some clarity. Okay, and the last question is from Julia. Alina, thank you for, your, for the video. You mentioned uh, in your comment, unlearning fear. How does that actually happen? What does the process feels like in terms of emotions and feelings? You also mentioned insomnia related emotions that are not enemies. What do you think about sadness and depression? They are definitely the byproducts of insomnia. However, how to turn them into a friend? Thank you. Okay, let's take the first part of the of the question uh, about unlearning fear. Uh, fear. So, how does that actually happen? Well, I know that um, some of you might, might have already some uh, assumptions that unlearning fear happens, uh, you know, like kind of smoothly and and okay, I, now I'm applying some uh, courage, I'm facing this fear and, and I'm gradually getting better. But in reality, at least for me, unlearning fear is, is a messy process. It's really um, like a place where you don't know where to go, what is happening to you and, and uh, you don't really know what you're doing. And the reason for that is that there are no definite answers. There is no like step-by-step -step guide to lead you out of insomnia or make you stop fearing uh, sleeplessness. Uh, it is more about exposing yourself over and over to things that uh, that kind of like scare you. Uh, meaning that um, you know uh, when when you cannot fall asleep and then and then all the all the fear, all the emotions that come. Uh, it is not about taming them. It is about like meeting them face to face and seeing them for what they are and sometimes it doesn't mean that they uh, disappear the moment when you get in, 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 in touch with them sometimes you just simply don't know what to do and and, and if I could uh, if I could um, you know generalize this kind of process is all about 
first of all it's messy like if, if you try to look for a logic there it's it, there is none but what I noticed is that the, the messy period when you are just trying to figure out things trying to find um, the the way where you are more accepting more willing to face the fears uh, and yet not being able to let go of, of those emotions uh, can take some time until the moment when something clicks something clicks and you get clarity you know what to do you know how to react or you know basically like what is happening to you and gradually things get better then again then again the fear comes back it again brings you a kind of opportunity to face your fears again and then you go through the same process of this chaos and, and, and dealing with your emotions and thoughts and then moment of clarity again happens so with time the more you're willing to go through those kind of iterations the ratio between like how long the periods of this uh, chaos uh, to uh, periods of clarity changes so maybe in the beginning it's all it seems like it's nothing but just uh, a lot of messy process uh, and uh, just a little bit of this moment of clarity but with time that ratio changes towards having more like stretch period when you feel more like okay I understand what is happening and then sometime for a brief moment you feel like okay I'm freaking out again and so on and then you're again facing your fears and, and you know going through that that uh, uh, unstructured process and then again clarity comes back so the clarity periods of when you uh, see things clearly uh, becomes larger so I don't know if that makes sense but uh, this is something that uh, how it went for me so maybe if you have some uh, di uh, different or you know um, some experience that you would like to share then uh, uh, send it in the comments Okay, and the second part of the questions you, uh, of the question you also mentioned insomnia related emotions that are not our enemies. What do you think about sadness and depression? They are definitely the byproducts of insomnia. However, how to turn them into a friend? Well, uh, to me, sadness and depression. I would say like depression, the lighter kind. I'm, I'm not sure about this clinical depression, and because it's it's I don't want to go to that uh, to the definitions, but. For me, feeling like uh, kind of like depressed and sad, it's generally the same the same thing. And again, any emotions are natural emotions. Uh, uh, all people have have those emotions. And um, when you think about like why the, what those emotions mean, and I actually um, you know, Google for some study or some paper, uh, which is called like depression in uh, an evolutionary context. And there are like two quotes that I just want to read it. Uh, first, sadness is closely linked to a loss of attachment to a child or to a partner, relative or close friend. And then uh, the second quote, many triggers for sadness and depression result from loss of some sort of and should uh, lead to making up the loss or accepting it. So I I was fascinated to find that kind of this loss of attachment or, or loss, uh, you know, the, when, when you realize that you're losing something, uh, it kind of resonated uh, with me and in context of insomnia because, uh, you know, uh, throughout the process, when, when, when we struggle with our sleep, uh, there is a huge des desire to make sleep happen. So we are, we become very much attached to the outcome. We become, uh, uh, craving like some perfect sleep and uh, naturally we want to try to control sleep but the reality is such that sleep is beyond our control we cannot make uh, we cannot fall asleep uh, on command it is only the letting go of control that allows sleep to happen and and to me like this sadness is linked to this kind of like loss of attachment is actually the process of letting go of that control we become aware that we cannot really win this fight we cannot fight with our sleep because we have no control there and that feeling of sadness or maybe it's also accompanied with this feeling of um, being defeated is something that um, brings that kind of like the last um, the last uh, uh, emotion that is basically lets us to just stop trying just not do anything at all 
and and this is where magically uh, people find themselves like they just fall asleep they didn't have any hope they were not trying to do anything and and then sleep just happened so I would say that sadness is actually a sign that your body or your brain is about to give up on trying to sleep and to me uh, this is one of the kind of like of a good signs in a way that that um, uh, we finally like stop fighting and, and uh, there is nothing that st stands in, in the way of sleep so I hope that, that ma this makes sense and uh, the last thing I just wanted to comment about this kind of like turning something into a friend and I, I know that I, I've said this before and um, in this case I don't think like uh, becoming friends with some difficult emotions is the right word I would say that it is not really possible to uh, to befriend or 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 to like something against our will. So if we genuinely don't like something and now we force ourselves to like it, I would I would say that it will create more more struggle rather than the actual befriending or, or liking something. So I would maybe rephrase it to more of like accepting, you know, those emotions and being with them. Uh, uh, while supporting yourself, uh, being self-compassionate and this is something that can make the process of uh, processing those emotions a bit easier you're just not fighting with those emotions, emotions you just let them be and while you let them be uh, then you uh, take care of yourself you treat yourself as you would treat your best friend without pushing, without uh, judging uh, without uh, blaming for things that you know no one can can control so I would say you know uh, if if befriending emotions comes naturally that's great but if it doesn't co doesn't come naturally there's no need to push like to you know befriending something or liking something sometimes it's just uh, you know uh, allowing it to stay with you whether you like it or not and just you know uh, supporting yourself during that during that difficult moment so I hope that you find the, uh, found this uh, uh, helpful, this episode. Uh, and uh, if there are any follow-up questions, uh, I will be really glad to answer them in one of my next videos. And uh, I just want to say thank you for watching. Bye.